three lectures about uh, uh, more about protein structure. So I will actually have a lecture on Wednesday also because I think I will be too stressed otherwise. So today I will talk about what you call people use called threading, or which is basically it's very similar to model modeling, but it's, it's particularly from uh, historical perspective, it's a bit interesting to go through. And it's also a bit about more about structure, functional relationships, and so on. So what, what, what can you learn from structure? Tomorrow, I will talk about what people call abelian predictions. But really, if you have no homology structure, how can you the structure? A bit more about, about protein folding in general. And then on Wednesday, I will talk a bit more about domains and, and domain databases. So. That's, and that's going to be the last lectures for this year. So, of course, somehow what we are interested in is, I mean, one reason to get the structure is actually get the function. And there are, uh, as I think I mentioned in other studies, there are lots of different functional classifications and they used to be all databases of very specific genomes so you want to have and this is some of this actually helps quite a lot of structure particularly if you go to enzymes so you know that you had this easy classification of different types of enzymes because here can be if you have a structure uh, so sure homology can tell you a lot about if uh, of enzymes but you can also have a, actually as the point mutation at the active site and the enzyme is not functional anymore so you're going to get often much more functional information. You can see if the binding site has changed or if there are some shard changes in the active size of that. So you can get more uh, structural functional in information by looking at the structure that you can get just from the sequence. And if you also remember, we had this kind of geo annotation, so it was a way to, 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 to describe a system for describing Functions. So the ontology that describes how we can describe function of a protein or a gene. And it had three main categories had biological processes, cellular component, or molecular function. And certainly, structure is primarily related to molecular function. We can't really tell what biological process if it's part when, from, from the structure. Because I mean, it's really what pathways in the mold. I mean, it's more like the systems biology things that we talked about earlier, but you can often of course, guess what function is doing. Cellular component is neither very uh, related to structure either, but of course there are some, we know that if it's metabolism, it should be the mitochondria and things, and if it's the memory protein, we can always memory protein and stuff, so there are some parts you can maybe learn from structure, but in general, structure is re related to molecular function. Uh, so of course, molecular function is a biological process. It has all these type of things: like physiological process, regulation of biological process, regulations, cellular process development. A lot of things that are not all related to structure. And the cellular components, of course, it can be in the cell, it can be outside the cell, it can be in the matrix, it can be in an organelle, it can be in the virus. So there are different types of. Uh, still, this is all on the cellular level. It's not like liver cell. It's like it's, it's the Top level is cell there, because we're talking about genes. So, of course, the liver has the same genes as the uh, brain. But the molecular function is more what we care about in structure. So, often you have enzymes, of course, thing, but it's, it's not. Many, many proteins are not just enzymes. We always think about enzymes as a main protein category, and somehow, of course, you, you are an enzyme, but clearly, it's a type of normal enzyme. And the function is not really catalytic activities of that. But you have a lot of things that are involved in transport, for instance, a lot, a lot of regulation. This is very many genes are doing. So you regulate the expression of other proteins or you modify other proteins, which of course is an enzyme, which kind is often. You have chaperones that are helping other proteins to fold correctly. So, the lot, so, so even on molecular function level, you have a lot of different, there's many things that are not just enzymes. And of course, binding is a key thing. And also that you have both binding small molecules and binding big molecules and binding other processes that are other genes and stuff there. But that, that of course means, doesn't mean that, to me you can have many of these, the same gene can have many of these functions. It can both of course be 
bind something and have, have catalytic activity. So, we also know that we have uh, proteins, we said last time, so we can divide proteins in some types of folds, and we can divide them. So, this is a cast documentation here, oh, classification here. So, you had alpha, alpha, beta, beta, and the rest, something with no signal structure. So, and we know that also that this is how my coupled functions. For instance, this thing here in the middle is a tin barrel. So, if you know we have a tin barrel, you wear often an enzyme. Like the DNA binding proteins often alpha beta also. So you know even from the structure class you can guess what you what, what the thing is doing to some extent. And but you can of course in general so then there are what you call architecture here. So you can divide things into like barrels and sandwiches and rolls. There is a roll list. It's just a. Uh, yeah, it's a sandwich-like thing, but it's not flat. And you can, even this one can divide and it's fragment. But of course, most things in structure, functional things are coupled to the, on this level. So there is always a discussion, for instance, are team barrels here, are they homologous or not? Because all, all team barrels look the same, from one perspective. They all have eight beta helix pairs. But you can find team barrels that are doing very, very different things. They're mostly enzymes, almost all, all of them enzymes. But some of them have an, a catalytic site in one part, and some has another catalytic site in another part. So it's clear the enzymatic function is very different. They do different catalytic reactions, not even in all the same residues. So that would indicate that these proteins have evolved a bit independently. And it has to be some argument that it's a very regular fold. So it's, it's not unlikely that it has been evolved several times at the same time. But on the other hand, you can actually find statistically significant sequence signals between each pair here. So you can basically say that all these eight here are, I don't know, not identical, but they are on average more similar than I would expect at random. So they are, there might be some original evolutionary unit that was just one, two of these together, and you had eight of these together that come together, and then a few together, and you got eight of these. And you find it between quite distant members, this one. So people, some people argue this is this is evidence for that this was they all are homologous and they all evolved together. But uh, it might also be so that because these signals we find are also just that they had looked at us for, for having this fault. It's also it's, it's, it's hard to say. And anyhow, it's clear that if they evolved from one of many axes, it was a long, long time ago. Has been a lot changed later. But it, this is the start, type of question you can start asking when you have the <coughs> function and structure of all of the proteins. But it's one thing we should think about when we see this here. It's not that actually these are, this is not the only structure. This is just a structure of a domain. I think I mentioned it before, so that's we have, most, most, most proteins, or many proteins, particularly in the high eukaryotes, because it's a multi domains. And. So, uh, the multi domain proteins have uh, three. Uh, so, this is an example. So, this has what's called SH2 domain, up, some alpha helical bundle, and octahedral bundle. So, why do we call this uh, three domains? Well, one reason we call this if you look at it structurally, if you plot the number of contacts that are between residues, you can find three distinct categories. Or you can uh, find that there are some, I mean, this is one group, so just, just from like structure perspective. So this is what, what this other immersion people do, is that they say this is a domain that is independent. The other thing is that you actually can find these domains in other, other uh, databases, in other, other proteins. So this SS2 domain is an SS2 domain that's extremely common and exists in thousands of proteins. They're all evolutionary related, but they're not always 
combined with this type of other domain. Sometimes they are and sometimes you can't with others. So can you have an example of that if you go to go to another video for more about this on Wednesday. If you go to PFAM and you go to SH2. So this is the PFAM database and this is the main database not based on structure but on uh, um, external sequence on evolution. So, so you have here is SH2 domain, it looks like that. Quite similar to what you saw. Hmm. So that. But you can see that this domain here, so you can look at this domain, you can look at it sequence wise, you can find a signal that it basically looks like that. It has uh, some conserved position in the beginning and some other position in the conserved end there. But what is interesting is that you can find it as the two domains, many different type of objects. You can find it often with the Chinese. Putting kind of domain. But sometimes it's, it's a stuck domain here, before it. Sometimes it has. Uh, both uh, pH main and SH2 domain, sometimes there are two SH2 domains next to each other, sometimes there are uh, well, some other combinations, and there are some other domains, and almost alone, if I'm doing some, some SH3 domain. So, lots of different combinations, and you can see in total it's uh, a lot of uh, well, 466 different combinations in this case. So it, it's, it's one of these virtual domains of find many, many different things. So there are a few of these that are very common, but uh, not that many. So what we do in this database, and actually oft, often we do when we do homology modeling, is to actually try to fit the structure with the domain, because that's kind of the unit we use. Mm. Well, as I said, we can have this 3D structure, we can have an idea about the structure. In particular, we can find, we just using the structure, we can use some uh, finding homologs, so there are, as I said, but in particular, but you, you look at, as always in biology, there are always exceptions and examples, so like, as I said, team balance. You have many, many folds, f f f well, the structure is the same, but you can have five different, func uh, different functions, they are all Enzymes, almost all enzymes, but they are different types of enzymes. And you see the binding site in different places. All the oxidases has a binding site here, and the isobases has a binding site here, etc. But there are also, of course, exceptions. You have, for instance, carbonic. These are both carbonic anhydrases, and they have nothing to do with each other. They're completely different. So there are exceptions, but in general, of course. Evolutionary structural similarity infer structural infer functional similarity. But it's not so easy. It's like there are a lot of examples you can have these proteins and proteins are quite similar. They're four percent identical. This is lysozyme, one of the best studied proteins in the world with everything that it's folding on. And then it's like albumin. The structures are identical you see this has a loop here, here like you can hardly see the difference in these two pictures. And the four percent identical, so that's that's a good a good homology modeling. One is the enzyme, one is only the enzyme. Uh, and you have a case here where you have only eight percent sequence identity. For this protein, I say this eight percent sequence identity is very very low sequence identity. It's often hard to detect protein that's low sequence identity. But the structures, so if you do sequence searching, it will be hard to find this. But Look at the structure; they look identical, and the function is identical. This is hemoglobin. This is hemoglobin has a hemoglobin binding stable there. And here's a case where we actually have also low identity, but you have it's somehow a similar structure. You can see that these two here, this is here, and these sheets here are similar, but this one is completely different part up here, and that one is part here that doesn't exist. 
So both ends sunk, but they're very, very different uh, activities. So since that all, it's not so easy to say that, oh, I have a homologous function, and that's why I, then I can get function. And of course, the problem is today, in the database, this is the assumption we make all the time. If you go, if you go to Unibrot, or any problem database, if you look at the evidence for how for function expectation is inferred by homology in 90% of the cases, because nobody has taken that protein and studied it. Because there are 50 million of these. And nobody has taken an individual and studied it. So it's just a big guess that they are similar, but the function is the same because on average they should be there because they're homolo homologs. So it's always a bit, always hard to, I mean, always a bit careful. In this case, you probably could have detected it because this is really a point mutation somewhere in the active site. So if you know that the site looks like, you know the site is, you see that it's one, one, one the residue is not there and it should be like catalytic. You, you could guess it. In this case, you could maybe also guess it because you have active site, I guess, here somewhere. In this case, it's exposed to, to the surrounding. In this case, it's not. So you could say, ah, oh, it must be some other active site, something else. It's DNA polymerase and this is other new structure. So you can do it, but it can, it's not a one-to-one -one situation at all this. At the same time, of course, you have proteins that are, that are not uh, I mean, that are related. So this is in the case of a domain combination. So this is a acyl phosphatase, and uh, then this, this is some virus. So they folds are similar. The structure is very similar. So if you can make a homology, they're probably homologous. Oh, my my homologous is not obvious. Who knows? It could be similar. But this one has a big X domain here to make it do something else. These are clear two proteins are not uh, related. But they do the same thing here also. This is serine and peptidases. They're basically the same catalytic activity. This is a mix of alpha beta. This is just a beta sheet thing. So they're not clearly not the other. But of course, you could, if you had a structure, and you know how the catalytic site is here, they are in the same. They're the same arrangement of, 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 of residues in the catalytic site. They're doing exactly the same chemical function. So there are methods that can take a catalytic site and look for all other proteins. Do you have any other set of residues that are doing the same, looks in the same arrangement? And uh, then does that, uh, so you can get function also, if, if, if you have it. So you, but in most cases, that, I mean, there are a few ends and a few things you can do it, but in general, it's, you can't do it. So we always have to be, be careful when we look for functional classifications from structure, from structure homologs, and that. And they even experimental structures, so you have got the structure of the experimental system, is correct, but you have no idea what it does. Because there, there, was, there was been this effort to try to get the structure of every protein in some genomes. Some of them you got a nice structure, but you still have no idea what it does. And sometimes you're lucky, you find a binding, some molecule binding to it, and you can get, so this is NAD binding, because it happens to be an NAD there. But it's, it's not always this structure function that is so easy. Okay, so now I will talk about uh, uh, how do we know what is the best method to get structure? And this is a bit of a historical overview from the last 20 years or so of what's called CASP or the protein structure, uh, uh, what, the critical assessment of techniques for protein structure prediction. So this is uh, interesting from one perspective. I mean, that's a couple of perspectives. One is actually that it's, it was really needed because as long as I've been a scientist, basically people have claimed to solve the protein folding problem, but or start to do start prediction. But until at least very recently, none has really proved that it worked. It's not that people cheat, really, it's, but may, some people do, but most people do not. It's just that you make your selective choices of, of, of results more when you optimize things. So basically, you, you, you do an overtrained method that you, you test the things and it works, and then you're happy and you present it. So, that was realized, so this started in the mid-90s. So basically, before cyblos, at the time when the genome probably was starting and there were a lot of, still the number of structures was increasing and so on. 
And it was a lot of people that had to do that. And, and one problem is, of course, that you have... Uh, so the only way to test it... Suppose you can get all the programs together, and you can do a benchmark, and people did that, you can do it. But there was always some programs for very, very long time to run, so it was difficult to do it. And some other programs were also distributed, because they were not free to... So the only way that was... Uh, uh, people realized is that we actually had to do a blind test. Uh, so we had... Uh, That's a third party, so someone who did not make the predictions evaluated the predictions, and that anybody who wanted to participate could do that. But there was no way that these people that did the predictions, or the rest of the community, could know the answer. Because the structures had to be... It's not like, uh, don't, don't look at this, we do this. Because it has to be blind. So nobody knew the answer at the time of the prediction. So the idea was basically that we have, uh, uh, well, particularly John Moult was the driving person here. 94 was the first prediction held. Competition. So it's not a competition, it's called assessment. But it's very competitive. Uh, so then it will run from 94 until 2014 was the last one, 2016 is the next one. Um, it was, has been run every two years. So the idea is more or less like this, and it hasn't changed very much. So somehow the community goes out to ask the structure of all this in the world. So people that are doing crystallography or NMR or cryo-EM or something like that. To do structure to, to ask, what are you working on? What structures are you going to have ready by August? And uh, uh, then you ask, can we have the sequences? So then they get the sequences and look, look, look at them a little bit and then put it on the website. And if the structure is known, they are told not to tell, talk about it, not to publish it. It's been a few cases of leaks here, like people put things on the website or a bit. Uh, submit a post or something, but in general, it's become quite secret. And, uh, there have been a few cases, and they may have been detected by the case that some group has done things too well. If somebody, someone jumps through one case up, but anyway, then once you ha then everybody else from somehow so during summer more or less do a structured prediction, so they can do whatever they want, it's up to them, and uh. Uh, do the predictions, and then these experimental be, be, people give the structure to the organizers, and then after the deadline of all the predictions, the structures are the predictions are analyzed by a group of experts. These are people who did not do predictions themselves, and they do it blindly. So they don't know who, who did what prediction. And of course, in the beginning, it was kind of manual things. <coughs> But, but now there's a lot, lot of tools have been developed to do this. So it's, not, it's not completely automatic, but it's still an expert assessment. You can choose what tools to use and what you want to do. And then in December, it used to be a meeting where you see, wait, uh, wait for the results. So, so in the beginning, was, this is like the history of the first six CASPs. And it was number, now it's CASP 11, it cost 12 maybe this year, I guess. And the number of targets was in the beginning, it was like 30, and then it got more and more, I think about 200 now. And the number of predictions, in, uh, number of predictors has been around a few hundred. It hasn't increased so much, and it's maybe you, you make 50,000 predictions. Uh, the difference is nowadays there are two categories. They are both uh, 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 it has both been uh, <coughs> Uh, automatic category and uh, uh, manual category.
て、うん、so uh, some, so, so some, some time ago it was some kind of people tried to understand what what have we learned from these twenty years of such prediction. It was a golden bean also a golden sun fish golden sun have put in faults. I'll talk more about putting forward tomorrow, but in general, that has been like a grand challenge in biology, more in physics. But it also, we want to understand biology, we want to get function, we do prediction function, we want to at least declare some people from prematurely declaring that they have solved the problem. So if you, if you claim you solve the problem, but you don't do well here, people trust you. But importantly, we want, want to uh, reveal what is the best way to what is the best way to put them on links? So this is like, and uh, it has probably been somehow through. Unfortunately, through his history, I don't think we really learned very much physics. Really, in Casper, maybe not just learned much biology either. So we, it is a lot of engineering. So we're really good at making computer science. It's like the trick here is we never want to do something. Uh, we really want to. <coughs> You put up nice pythons and never fail, and that work very well. But, but, but we, we, we have been pretty good at picking out parts of methods that work together, and uh, part of things that are actually uh, been uh, uh, useful. So in Cas, you know, I have had. In the beginning, you have, and still you have more or less three categories. So you had what's called homology modeling, which is what we talked about last week. So basically, how do you make best model? It's always been very difficult modeling targets. So like the easy ones, you never evaluated because they're basically all the models look the same. It's very difficult to say which is the best one. Which I always think is a bit sad, but you should, you should do it. Uh, and we have had what's called new false prediction whenever things are, uh, uh, when something looks like nothing else in the database before. So basically you have a protein, but it's nothing, it's not anything else, that's, that's it, called have an issue or new false prediction. This is what I'll talk about tomorrow. But there's always been a category in between, but you have what's called fold recognition. So basically you have a structure of protein, the fold of it, you want to recognize it to make a model of that, but, but without any secret model, at least no easy to take the secret from model. So it has been like that, uh, that uh, this has been a category that actually advanced quite a lot in the beginning. So this is basically, you can say it's almost like compared to modeling, only modeling, but it has been improving a lot, but it's, been more, but it's more difficult, it's more difficult targets. And uh, I'll talk more about some examples of people do there in a second, but I just want to show you basically the results here. So this is, what happened here you can see is, is this is the, some measure of quality of the models, or the best model, or average model, something like that. And this is a different CASP, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. So see, the first CASP performance jumps a lot, and this is the difficulty, so some measure of difficulty. And you see, it jumped a lot, and you see, it was some jump here, and actually between 4 and 5 jumped again a bit here, particularly this category over here. But it's been a slow increase, and it's has continued since later, also. Well, the same one. So the idea of this full recognition, or thread thing was also used, it didn't work so it's basically that you would, there was all, something that occurred in the mid, early 90s even, that you have a sequence and you want to ask which fold is it most similar to, what is it, which structure is most similar. Same how it's somehow the same problem as in, in sequence alignment. But the assumption was then that it was, if we, we, if we assume the structure is more concerned than the sequence, we can, we can do it on a structural level. We can try, try to not use only the sequence, but use the structure information also. Like we, we, we know more than the sequence about the structure. We know, we know the structure of it. So we don't only know the, know, know the sequence. Of course, if it's very high, if it's very similar to one, we can use just BLAST. But there are cases when we can't use BLAST. So the idea is basically you want to find a relation, you want to find alignment here, you want to basically find that these two sequences are the same, while well, some parts are not the same. So you want, to, you want to take your sequence and thread it, like, uh, 
like uh, yeah, let's it through this through another sequence see how well it matches. So the idea is somehow that you take your sequence and you calculate not the sequence similarity to the template, but actually if you make the model and look at how good is the model. How, I mean, this is what this is the energy of the model. And you can use different type of information, but you can basically use context here, or you can use the whatever is on the surface. So you can look at more, more, more simpler hard models. So, uh, in the beginning, so I will talk about two methods here. This is from the early nineties. There was a thread. There was one put a name. Three D one D profile was method slightly earlier. And then people use other things later, we'll talk a bit about them later. But in principle, of course, it, you can do the same thing with sequence. Nothing stops from doing the sequence. And nowadays, I would say that sequence methods are as good or even better. But it was for a while, we saw that people thought that the structure of methods should know, but this was really taking over because we have so many more sequences now, right? And we used that. But it was for a while that actually these methods were really good. So actually, the best method is often just lost. If you can have it more edges lines on that. Maybe I'll talk about this after break. So now it's so that's me. Five minutes past. Okay. Talk coffee. Keep on talking. Okay.